Hello and welcome to Puck Pursuit, a hockey podcast by The Score. I'm your host, John Madison. Today's episode is presented by Subway's $6 Barbecue Pulled Pork Mighty Melt Combo. Try it today. Here with colleagues Josh Wegman and Sean O'Leary, we're going to unpack uh, the first day and a half of free agency and uh, just get going on some winners and losers. We're going to talk about the Sebastian Ajo offer sheet situation and look ahead to uh, potential signings remaining in the free agency period. Uh, Josh, how's it going, man? Good. Uh, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Sean? Same here. Doing well. All right, guys. Let's let's get after it with, uh, with the main topic of discussion. I should mention we're recording this Tuesday afternoon. Uh, who knows what will drop while we are recording. Um, but the main situation that we have on our laps here is Sebastian Ajo getting offer sheeted by the Montreal Canadiens. And obviously he signed it, which makes it real news. Um, and then the Carolina Hurricanes have said, hey, you know what, we're going to match that. Um, so it ends up being a bit of a moot point in regards to player movement. Looks like Sebastian Ajo is staying in Carolina. But uh, we'll start with you, Josh. What what was your takeaway from this whole situation? Well, I mean, it's fun to see, of course. And I guess good on Bergevin for trying, but... I mean, the execution was just terrible. Like, it's just way too low of a cap hit. Like, Carolina never had to think twice about matching this offer sheet. And, I mean, maybe he thought with the front-loaded bonuses that they wouldn't be able to have the pockets to match it. But, I mean, they were obviously wrong. And, it, I don't know, it's just now you look at Carolina and they have Ajo on a great contract, like eight and a half for a premier young top-flight center. Like, that's a that's a good deal. I guess the two things that you can't be happy with if you're the Hurricanes is, one, the five-year term that walks Ajo straight into free agency. Not ideal. Paying all these bonuses up front, you know, they clearly didn't want to do that. Otherwise, they would have had a deal done with Ajo ahead of time. Um, And thirdly, I think just they've basically got shoved in a corner. Like, they've been told how to do their business, which, I mean, is not ideal, right? You'd like to negotiate with his agent. You'd like to see... Um, what the middle ground ends up being and the Habs decided that they would decide that for them yeah it's kind of a bummer that we dealt with this speculation about offer sheets all season and through the early parts of the off season and it ended up being a complete dud I mean none of it really makes sense at all from Montreal's perspective I've uh, developed a bit of a conspiracy theory here oh yeah let's hear on it. the situation and do you think it's at all plausible that Don Waddell and Mark Bergevin were in communications and Waddell said, hey, give us an offer sheet because it's been reported that Ajo and Carolina weren't seeing eye to eye. So what if Waddell said, offer sheet our guy, front load it with signing bonuses so it creates some speculation and we'll just match and we'll have our player for an incredible cap hit for five years. I don't hate that conspiracy. I don't know if it's true, but I don't hate where you're coming from, especially when Bergevin addressed the media and kept bringing up that Ajo wants to be a Canadian. He's kind of like, you know, saying it a little too much. It's like, okay, we get it. You don't have to go through this script that you seem to have. And the fact that Waddell, you know, held his own press conference and seemed totally fine with uh, with with matching the offer, it's, it seemed like it wasn't too uh, it wasn't too heated between the two parties. Yeah, I love that Carolina didn't sweat it at all publicly. Both Waddell and Tom Dundon just said it was a waste of time. I think that's as dramatic as it basically gets between executives in the NHL. So, well, it could have been more exciting. I think it was pretty good. I just, I just, from a Montreal point of view, I just can't understand Bergevin actually believing that they weren't going to match it. Like, if you, if you really like Ajo, and he'd be a good fit there, of course... But if you're going to do it, then pony up and go, you know, 10, 10 and a half million and deal with the compensation you have to give up, like as if it's actually going to happen. But there was just never a doubt that Carolina was going to match it. Yeah. For anyone who's unfamiliar with the offer sheet compensation tiers, uh, what Ajo received is the third tier and the package going the other way uh, to Carolina if if this had all blown up in in the hurricane's face was a first rounder a second rounder and a third rounder a pretty poor uh return really if you're losing your best player um whereas if montreal went all guns a blazing and offered him the max 
or the highest tier than it would have been four first rounders. Like that's a dramatic difference. And there's a tier in between that mixes a little bit more and, and, and sweetens the pot. But Montreal kind of played it safe by giving like, you know, really a, a reasonable deal at the end of it. It's, you know, 8.5 over, you know, times five years. So 42.3, I believe, is the uh, the number when you round up um, to a player that's 21 years old, plays center, got 83 points last year he's you know he's a catalyst on offense he's, he's not riding anyone's coattails um this guy's a star and if he wasn't in carolina he'd be an even bigger star like it's almost like bergevin unintentionally or maybe intentionally set the rfa market by off you know by by giving an offer sheet that was kind of underwhelming yeah if you look at it from the lightning or the Leafs' perspective, trying to lock down Braden Point and Mitch Marner, respectively. I mean, if they they those both those cases can use Sebastian Aho as a pretty good comparable, and I think both teams would love to have their players at eight and a half million, especially when it seems like Marner's only asking for eleven and a half. <laughs> only, uh, yeah. I mean, if if you're if you're putting those three players next to each other. You, I don't know if you can justify like perfect world where comparables always align with each other. Aho, Point, Marner, you know, you can argue till you're blue in the face, you know, who's the best player there, who has the, the highest ceiling, but they're all within the same ballpark. And, and at the end of the day, it should be, you know, a million, two max between those three players. Yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, they're all right in that same tier. I think personally, if I were to rank them, I'd have Aho number one just because he's a center, as his point centers are much more valuable, have a lot more responsibility on the ice. And plus, he had a great year while playing with Justin Williams and Warren Fogle a lot and Tara Vine. And, like, these are, like, some decent players, but nothing compared to Marner playing with Tavares or Point playing with Kucherov. I mean, Aho, he's, he's special. He's legit. Yeah, it'll be interesting how this all sort of trickles down. And as all three of us know, you know, if you're an agent who represents an, another RFA, you're looking the other way at this offer sheet. You're going, oh, that has nothing to do with us. <laughs> what are you talking about that there that Sebastian Ajo is a comparable? I don't, I don't know what you're talking about because it does really like lower the bar. I mean, even Matthew Kachuk. Uh, and, oh, well, and also, I think one thing that I forgot to br- bring up was Timo Meyer's contract. So four years, six million dollars. You could make the argument that that is the steal of the entire July first, half of July second, as we're speaking right here, in terms of the value of that contract. Uh, with with Meyer seemingly going on an upward trajectory and not stopping anytime soon. Uh, yeah, I think that's an outstanding contract for the Sharks, and it's interesting we've seen so much talk about signing bonus and front-loaded contracts but the Sharks and Meyer did the opposite so in the fourth year Meyer's going to get 10 million in salary meaning when that contract expires his qualifying offer is 10 million so five years from now and then six years from now even if Meyer accepted his one year qualifying offer at 10 million guy's going to make a ton of money yeah it's a it's a nice piece of business by not only the GM Doug Wilson to get creative and you know, sort of uh, kick the ball down the road and, and fit, you know, hey, we'll figure this out in five years in terms of the potential $10 million price tag. And also his agent, Meyer's agent, Claude Lemieux, like to th- sort of like, I don't know how often that's happened where you see the last year being the biggest year and the qualifying offer to come with that being a pretty, pretty meaty package. Yeah, I don't think you see it very often. So like you said, so last year the salary's big, so then the qualifying offer is massive. And then say he just goes one year on the qualifying offer, then he's, I think, an unrestricted free agent after that. And he would obviously be able to cash in if he wanted. But I wouldn't be so Based on Doug Wilson's resume, something tells me they're going to agree on another long-term deal once this four-year deal expires and keep him in San Jose. Because anytime someone good goes to San Jose, they don't leave till they're old. That was what I learned.